Thank you for joining us online today. We at The House love to hear what God is doing in your life. And if you have a testimony, email that to us at amen at hotl.church. And if our house has impacted you in any way and you want to partner with us financially, please go to our website at hotl.church and click on the right top to give or text an amount uh, to 84321. Once again, thank you for being with us. Hope you enjoy the message. Have a great day. How y'all doing this morning? I come from Australia, actually. From the real south. Like the real, real south Australia. Well, guys, it's so good to be here. I'm super excited to be in this part of the world. I know we're like on the borderline of Idaho and Washington, and uh, it's really exciting to be, really, it's exciting to be here because I've been trying to get to America since March 2020, and I was unfortunately stuck in Australia uh, for about 12 months longer than anticipated, so we were trying to get here. Uh, last year in November, I believe it was, and then March or April, we were trying to be here. And so we finally made it to the greatest church in the region. Come on, somebody say amen. And uh, we had an awesome first service. And again, I, I just wanted to say thank you to, to Pastor Jeff and Robbie. You guys have incredible leaders of character, integrity, consistency. Can we just honor them this morning and thank God for them today? We appreciate you guys. We're kind of living in a world that doesn't like to honor people anymore, and so keep it at the center of your heart as a people of God. There's a famous preacher, and he says this statement. He says, honor is the ability to recognize someone for who they are without stumbling over who they're not. And when we come with that posture, we realize that not everybody has it together 100% of the time. is 100% perfect, but we can honor the God inside of other people if we're willing to honor them for who they are without stumbling over who they're not. And so we're swapping. Which one sounds better? All right. You had to say this one because we're not going to swap back. You know, so. And uh, my name is Joel Ramsey. I really, I'd come from Australia where my wife, Savannah, she was here for the first service. She's lovely. I think a bunch of you might have met her at Women on Fire. And uh, and uh, she's amazing. My two small children are with us. But we're now living in Nashville, Tennessee, pastoring a church there. And uh, anybody been to Nashville? It's a lot warmer there. And, uh, and so we're having an awesome time. We're excited for what God's doing. And before I get into the message this morning, I, those little shirts that you saw, the devil is a liar. You see some of the guys were in the round. Those shirts actually help us do missionary work. We, we started, we lived in Africa for four years, um, preaching the gospel, making disciples and, and all the t-shirt stuff that we sell helps continue the ministry and the mission work that we do in Africa and that we're extending into other parts of the world and into the dark places of America. So that helps us advance the gospel. Uh, so if you do want to get one of them, that'd be amazing. If you don't want to get one of them, buy it for someone else. And if you really still don't want to do that, well, go to the gala. <laughs> I'm excited for what God's doing in this church. I, I, I really am. I, the first service, my heart was just blessed to see such a group of hungry people searching for God. For And, and we're in the second service and a group of people, hungry people searching for God. And I said this to the men at the Men on Fire weekend, but the Bible says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. He fills the hungry, not the needy. And it's a posture shift. It's a decision to say, God, we want more of you in our lives. We want more of you in our family. We want more of you in our community. And so I'm thankful that this is a church that's hungry for the presence and the power of God. I'm thankful that this is a church that's truly influencing a region. 
that this is a place that people are getting saved, people are being filled with the Holy Spirit, a church that's making a huge impact. And so why don't you give yourselves a round of applause and thank yourselves because it's, it's awesome. I'm going to preach this morning and a message that I've called active Christianity. Active Christianity. I don't think we're supposed to be passive believers. I don't think we live a life of hidden faith. In fact, we are what's considered a proselytizing faith, which means we are a f- people that are supposed to tell other people about our faith. Some people don't like that we do that, but that's what we're called to do. And I believe we're called to be an active people of God, to continue to preach the gospel, to make disciples. This church is unreal. you got two jam-packed services, but can I tell you, there's supposed to be more than two. There's supposed to be more than three, and it's, we, you know, as pastors, we get blamed all the time. Well, you just want more numbers in the building for this and that. We want more people to know Jesus. And the more people that know Jesus, then we need more people to know Jesus. And people, I was not about the numbers. Well, is one a number? I don't know. You tell me, is two a number? Is three a number? It's not for bragging rights. It's for salvation rights for those who need it. For that one that's lost, it's really important that we want to have more people in the building. We're called to advance the kingdom. This, we're supposed to be active. And so I want to read you a passage of Scripture out of the book of Matthew chapter 16, verses 17. Matthew chapter 16, verse 17. This is what it says. It says, Jesus said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. This is Jesus speaking to who becomes Peter, and he'd asked him, Who do you say that I am? And Peter responded and said, you are Jesus Christ, the son of the living God. He said, this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my father in heaven. And I also say that you are Peter and on this rock, I will build my church. Peter is not the rock. It's the revelation of Jesus Christ crucified, that he's the son of the living God. Jesus is the cornerstone. Jesus is our firm foundation. And on that revelation, he says, I'm going to build my church. And the gates of Hades or the gates of hell will not prevail against it. As we go this morning, I want us to understand, I mentioned this last service at the end, but I want to mention it now. Over the last couple of years, churches have been closed down all around the world and more places, in some places more than others. And, and what as we desired as leaders and pastors to get back together, to get back to gathering there are those who criticized and wanted to say, you know, you know the, the church isn't a building. Can't you just do your thing elsewhere? I mean, I think we're all pretty smart enough to know that we realize that the church is a building, but it's also a people. A church is a structure. If you look up the definition of church, just generally speaking, it doesn't say a people. It would say a building. So we know that It's a building. It's a place that the church comes together. And Christ wants to build his church. He wants to build you and I. He doesn't want to just build us numerically, but he wants to build us in integrity. He wants to build us in power. He wants to build us in authority. He wants to build us in theology. He wants to build his people to be a force to be reckoned with. I know my assignment on earth that it's to destroy the works of the devil. The reason it's my assignment is because the Bible says that Jesus was made manifest that he might destroy the works of the devil. And I'm told in my Bible to live like Jesus. So if I'm to live like Jesus, I'm supposed to destroy the works of the devil. Sin, sickness, disease, torment, chaos, fear, every symptom, every side effect of all of the above, we are called to destroy. We destroy it with love and hope and faith and peace and kindness and gentleness and meekness. But you and I are called to advance the kingdom of God. You see, I believe that the Achilles heel of the modern day Christian is our insatiable desire to be loved and accepted by the world. 
that the Achilles heel of the modern day Christian is our insatiable, which means unsatisfiable desire to be loved and accepted by the world. The problem with trying to be loved and accepted by the world is we will often have to compromise our convictions in order to do so. Jesus says, remember, if they hate you, it's because they hated me first. We often think that every, if Jesus lived in 2022, that everybody would like him. That's not true. They didn't like him back then. They probably wouldn't like him now. They, they killed him. Like he wasn't a big fad. And I'm saying that not that we're supposed to be arrogant jerks of Christian to make sure nobody likes us. I'm saying that part of following Jesus, part of walking on the narrow road, means that we live according to God's word, not according to the world. And in doing so, we have to stop trying to please people because when we try to please the world, when we try to make them love us, we compromise in order to do so. And really, we're just lying because we're not telling them the whole truth. And it's the truth that will set them free, not your compromise. So we're not supposed to sit back in fear. We're supposed to press on in boldness and courage. Can I say this real quick before I move on? For so long, we've tried not to embarrass the name of Jesus. We've tried to protect God's reputation. I want to inform you this morning. We are not his protector. He is our protector. He's the one fighting for us. He's the one going before us. We're, there's an old preacher. He says, the gospel is like a lion. You don't need to protect it. You just need to let it out of the cage and let it do its mighty work. The gospel is a force to be reckoned with. And you and I are the carriers of that good news. And we're called to advance the kingdom of God. We cannot be a passive people. We need to be an active people. Amen. So point number one this morning, point, the first action of advancement is that we are called to preach the gospel. It's proclamation. The Bible says in the book of Acts chapter 1 verses 8, it says, you shall, re- you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. Anybody had the Holy Spirit come upon them in their life? Then you have received power for a purpose. It says, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you to be a witness. You receive the power of the Holy Spirit for a purpose. And that purpose is to be a witness of Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world. The Holy Spirit comes to reveal to us who Jesus is. He comes to convict us of sin and of righteousness. He comes to show us the way. And you and I have been filled with the Spirit. So we can be witnesses of the power of the saving grace of Jesus Christ. You see, we're all called to a point of proclamation. It says this in the book of Mark chapter 16 verse 15. Jesus said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. For some of you hunters, you've got to remember that. You've got to preach the gospel before you pull the trigger. Just make sure that elk ends up in heaven so you can get him again. <laughs> I'm actually not a hunter, but I should become one, right? I mean, no one's really invited me. <clears throat> That's fine. I've been stuck in Australia in that big prison, but probably shouldn't say that. We've all been commissioned. You see, the proclamation to proclaim means to publicly herald. It means to publicly announce. To preach means to open your mouth and tell somebody. And you and I have all been called to proclamation. Proclamation is not just for a preacher on a platform. It's for believers. And if you believe in the name of Jesus, He, Jesus, our Lord and Savior, He commissioned us to go into all the world and preach The gospel of preach is to proclaim, to publicly herald. We are to publicly herald the gospel, which means the good news of Jesus Christ. It means the arrival of God's 
kingdom. It means that Jesus Christ was born of the Virgin Mary and that he lived a sinless life, that he was crucified, killed upon the cross of Calvary, that he died, went into the grave, but he's good enough not to stay dead. So he took the keys of death in Hades and the Holy Spirit resurrected him from the dead, brought him back to the life, back to life. And now he's seated at the right hand of the Father, interceding on our behalf. We are called to proclaim the arrival of God's kingdom here on earth. We're called to share the good news. Not just if you're a preacher, but if you're a believer. The thing about good news is, though, that we need to understand is that the value, the, the weight, the essence of good news is found in recognizing that for there to be good news, there has to also be bad news. You see, for so long we got afraid of fearing people into the kingdom, we forgot to warn them about hell. Because we didn't want to fear people, we don't want to manipulate people out of a place of fear, which is wisdom, that's not the goal. We don't want to fear people into the kingdom, but we do still have a responsibility to warn them that the reason there's good news is because there is bad news. You see, the reason we value joy as a people is because we understand what it's like to feel sorrow. We value health because we know what it's like to be sick. We value the good news of Jesus because we know that without Him we are lost, we are broken, we are depraved, we are separate from God. And without Him, we will spend eternity in hell. And we don't like to use that word anymore because it sounds, but it's true. Eternity separate from God. The Bible tells us in John 3, 16, for God so loved the world. Some people like to tell us that God doesn't love sinners. That's just ridiculous. For God so loved the world. The world is not the trees or the water or the land. The world in the context speaks of the totality of fallen humanity, past, present, and future. For God so loved an indiscriminate love for the totality of fallen, sinful, broken humanity, past, present, and future. That he sent his only son, Jesus, that whosoever, which talks of whosoever, everybody, that whosoever would believe, which means to put complete trust and reliance upon, not just believe. The Bible says even the demons believe, but they fear and they tremble. That those who put complete trust and reliance upon Jesus would not perish, but have everlasting life. If there is a not perishing for eternal life for those who believe, then there is a perishing for those who don't believe. God did not send Jesus to condemn the world, but in order that through him the world might be saved. We don't serve an angry God in heaven who sent Jesus to send people to hell. We serve a loving God in heaven who saw that people were going to hell, so he sent Jesus to give them a way out. As he extends his hand of mercy and his hand of grace and his hand of compassion. And he says, all who call on my name shall be saved. Guys, you and I, in wherever we are called to be, if we believe, have a responsibility of proclamation to tell the world about the saving power of Jesus Christ. The best way to do that is to often tell your story. How he saved you, how he healed you, how he delivered you, how he fixed your family, how he fixed my marriage. We get opportunities to testify of his goodness. So number one this morning is this proclamation. Number two, action of advancement today is multiplication. The church is supposed to grow. We believe in a growing church because we believe in a church that multiplies and we believe a church multiplies through two ways. Salvation and discipleship. Evangelism starts church, church growth, but it's sustained through discipleship. 
We don't want to just get a bunch of people and emotionally manipulate them in a meeting with ups and downs and keyboards to put their hand up for a moment and walk outside and live like hell. We want people to experience His goodness, to respond to His mercy, respond to His grace, and then we want to intentionally teach them about Jesus. It tells us in the book of, uh, in the book of Matthew chapter 28, Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. Discipleship is part of our responsibility, and it's a part of our responsibility for the church. You and I are called. It's not just Pastor Joel Eklund's job to make disciples. It's your job to make disciples. I have a friend who they used to lead a church in the Philippines, and when we met them, the church was about 40,000 people. This is a small one. Over the next six years of our relationship with them, their church grew from 40,000 to up over 110,000 people. And they did it through discipleship. And they have this phrase that says, discipleship is relationship. We don't have to overcomplicate discipleship. We all know somebody. We all have relationship with somebody. But I would add this, that discipleship is relationship. But relationship is not discipleship. Discipleship is intentional relationship to teach somebody everything that God has taught you. You're a part of a great church with great preaching and great teaching. You learn from the servants of God who lead this church so you can go and teach somebody else everything that God has taught you. You fill yourself with the Word of God so you can tell. It's not complicated. For some, you can have 10. For some, you can have 12. For some, you can disciple one. For some, you disciple your family. My brother, little brother, used to say all the time that discipleship is a life transaction. It's me pouring my life into somebody else. Who can you take responsibility for to pour your life into? Into And would you be the kind of humble disciple maker that pours so much into somebody else that they get so much that they have to flip the coin and start discipling you because they're becoming so good at following? I mean, who cares? Well, I don't know who I'm discipling. I don't know. People don't want me to disciple them. Pour your life into somebody. It's intentional. And it's part of our responsibility to preach the gospel, to make disciples. The third one action of advancement this morning is this demonstration Matthew chapter 10 verses 7 says as you go preach saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand heal the sick cleanse the lepers raise the dead cast out demons freely you have received so freely give we are called to demonstrate the power and the kingdom of God I have a huge emphasis in my life around the healing power of God. And some people are like, Joel, it's not all about healing. It's, it's too much. It's all about Jesus. Yeah. And that's true. It is all about Jesus. Who was all about healing? <laughs> Everywhere that he went, he healed the sick and he drove out demons. You see, it's when we manifest and demonstrate the kingdom, it's the love of God being expressed through the power of God. You see, we live in a generation of everybody knows everything. Right? This, that. Can I tell you, sometimes we just need to be able to keep our mouths shut and demonstrate the kingdom of God. I'll tell you a real quick story. It's going to be hard to believe, but... Devil's a liar, not me. I remember being in Africa. The worship team can come. I remember being over in Africa and we were having these revival meetings and God was moving in a mighty way. A lady walked into this meeting. She was actually the drummer's mother and she'd flown in from Cape Town to where we live to be a part of what God was doing. And she came down the front for prayer. And I was going through and we are praying. The team were praying for people. I remember I was praying for her and as I prayed for her, she fell down and seemingly started napping in the service, which I thought was quite rude. She's there laying on the floor and God's touching her. It was amazing. I don't know what happened. I don't know what she needed. 
But at the end of the service, she comes up to me and she's so thankful. She says, thank you so much. When you prayed for me, I felt something hit me and I fell over. I don't know how to explain that. She's like, but as I was laying there for what felt like forever, my face began to tingle and I started feeling these tingling feelings down the side of my face, which makes sense if you're laying on your face for like 30 minutes. <laughs> but I said, yeah, I mean, you we're down there a while. She goes, no, it's not that. She said, 20 years ago, I was in a car accident, a taxi accident. Now, if you've not been to South Africa, their taxi system is not the same as our, our taxi system. It's a very different experience. But they were in a taxi accident. And she said, what happened was that accident almost killed me. It, it severed the tendons in my foot that my foot is now I had to be fused back together. I, I lost um, my sense of smell. I lost my sense of taste. And now because of the injuries I sustained, I have uh, IBS, irritable bowel syndrome, where nothing works properly. And she said, and I, I lost feeling all through my face because they had to put a metal plate in my face so that I could have everything fixed. And she said, so the fact that my face is tingling is a great sign because she's like, I haven't had feeling in that side of my face for 20 years. God totally restored her. Now, I'm going to tell you this, and this is where people might get weird, but I can't help you about that. I'm sorry. Is that that metal place in her face actually dissolved and disappeared. Now, for the skeptic in the room, I was that person. Sometimes still am, to be honest. You probably are. Well, yeah, where did that metal plate go? I don't know. Wouldn't have a clue where it went. I can't explain how that stuff happens. I mean, if it was once or twice, you could maybe explain the way that the person was lying and crazy. But when you see this stuff time and time again, I remember early days of my life praying for the sick, believing God for miracles all the time. I pro this is a guesstimate, but around 500 people in the early days testifying that God had miraculously healed them. You know, things like people who had... To, foot surgery and they break your foot I guess to reset your foot I don't know how that makes sense but you break the foot and so it resets the foot and she's walking around with some big boot on there are pins all in her feet and we pray for God to heal her and she goes home that afternoon she comes back to the meeting that night and she's like look I mean I don't know how you explain that stuff but it would have been over 500 ish times of people testifying and I was excited but there was this thing in me going God is this really happening I remember being in my bedroom just saying, God, either this is really working or all these people are liars. And then I just had to realize, I'm like, they can't be that many crazies. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like, I'm, I know there's probably a couple, but how can there be that many? That night, that lady, she was, her smell came back, her taste came back. She flew home to where she's from and she messaged up to one of our team the following week saying, my fused ankle has been restored. I've been running on a treadmill for the first time in 20 years. I genuinely don't understand all of that. What I do understand is that it's the love of God expressed through the power of God. We're called to demonstrate the kingdom. We're called to drive out demons. May the church never be so safe that nobody gets set free. May the church never become so relevant at a cost of the revelation of Christ and Him crucified. See, if there's a demon possessed or a demon oppressed person sitting in front of us, they don't need us to be cool. They don't need us to be relevant. They don't need me to put my skinny jeans on and my backwards hat to make sure I fit in. They need me to be radical. I don't need the world to love me. I need to love the world. They can think I'm crazy. They can think I'm foolish. It doesn't change that I've laid down my life. It's no longer I who live, but it's Christ who lives in me. And this life I now live is not a life to impress the world. It's a life that is Christ in me crucified to show the world the genuine love of God so that they might meet the one who can save their soul. We're called to demonstrate the kingdom of God. Praying for the sick to be healed is not limited to pastors on a platform. It's not limited to Jason McQuinn over at his little revival hub in Bearpaw there. 
All the crazy stuff seems to happen over there. It's limited to those who would believe. It's limited to those who would be willing to take the risk. And when someone says they've got a headache, you don't jump to your back purse to get your aspirin. You lay your hands on them and say, in Jesus' name, be healed. I don't have a problem with aspirin. If my headache's not going away, guys, I'm going to pop some aspirin. But I know where I'm going first. You know, America uses 70% of pharmaceutical drugs in the whole world. love of God expressed through the power of God because it's not all about healing it's not all about miracles it's all about Jesus who everywhere that he went he healed all kinds of sicknesses and all kinds of diseases I have arguments with well I don't argue with them but people try and argue with theologians want to argue with me about this that and the other I'm like just get in the dirt and put your hands on somebody and see what God does Theology is clearly important, but there's so many people with big theology with no skin in the game. The last one is we're called to domination. We're called to advance the kingdom of God. The first passage of scripture that we read, Matthew chapter 16, Verses 17, Jesus answered and said to him, Blessed are you, Simon by Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is him, who is in heaven. And I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades, the gates of hell, shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. I love the Lord of the Rings. Anybody Lord of the Rings lovers? I remember watching in that movie, there's a scene in the second movie where there's the orcs, the evil people, and they're, they're barraging Aragon and Legolas and Gimli and the whole crew, and they're, they're up behind a wall, and they're just sending horde after horde to break down this wall, one after another. Their strategy was to just wear them out and eventually take the city. And for so long as I read this scripture, it says that Christ is going to build His church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. I had this imagery, this picture that we're the ones behind the wall, standing firm as the enemy throws its darts at us, as it fights us. And it felt good. And I was like, yeah, we're standing firm. And then God flipped the switch on me for a minute. He began to show me that it says that the gates of hell will not prevail against the church that He's building. You see, if I'm behind a gate, whose gate is it? It's my gate. We're not on the back foot. It says the gates of hell, hell's gates, won't prevail against the forceful advancement of the kingdom of God, of a people of courage, a people baptized with the Holy Spirit and fire who have been filled with power for a purpose and we will take the territory back, we will take the schools back, we'll take the universities back, we'll take the internet back, we'll take our names back, we will take Instagram back. That will be a miracle, but we're gonna fight for it. Because we're the soles of our feet tread. He has given us this land. And I want to tell you, church, you are the church of Jesus Christ. And it cannot happen without you. How many people in this room, roughly? Joel? 200? Give or take? There's 2,200 people in Newport. Is that correct? Give or take? I'm not good at math, but that's like 10 people each need to hear about the gospel. If each one of us at least sowed the seed of the gospel into Newport, Washington, then the entire city would have at least heard the gospel. And how can they believe if they have not heard? And how will they hear if we do not preach? If each of us just prayed for 10 people in Newport, Washington, then every resident of Newport, Washington would have been prayed for. We are called to advance the kingdom. We're called to be an active people because we are endued with power from on high. We have received miraculous power 
for a purpose and that purpose is to tell the world about Jesus. If you believe it this morning, somebody give him praise. We are called for such a time as this. You were called for such a time as this. Your resource is called for such a time as this. Your family is called for such a time as this. There's an urgency in the air. The reason we're not seeing revival is because we're too content living without it. We've got comfortable. We survive. We're happy most of the time. It's time. I don't know about you, but America needs a move of God. It does. It really does. I mean, we're in a bit of a desperate state, if we're honest. The division, the hate, the chaos, the mistrust. We need a move of God. Jesus says, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth, be loosed in him. We're co-laborers with Christ. It's him and us. He's the king, we're his people. He's the head, we're the hands and feet. I'm just believing for the Holy Spirit to do something great in this house this morning. If you're in here this morning and you say, Joel, I need the Holy Spirit. I mean, maybe you've received the Holy Spirit like I have. Maybe you haven't and you're like, Joel, I want that for the first time in my life. Well, we're going to ask for it today. Maybe you're here and like he said, you like me, you've received the Holy Spirit. You're living by the Spirit, but you're just like, Joel, I want a fresh touch. Uh, my well's a little bit low. I want a fresh touch. Maybe you're here like, my well is overflowing. I have so much Holy Spirit and I'm totally hooked. So give me more. I mean, I don't know at what capacity your desire might be for the outpouring of the Spirit. But what I do know is that in the book of Acts chapter 4, those who were filled on the day of Pentecost were in another room praying for boldness, for miracles, for courage to preach the Word. And the Holy Spirit came and He filled them all again. We can't do it without Him. So if you say, Joel, I'm, I'm, I'm one of those four categories. I cast that net real wide. That was really wide to try and I'll even say this. If you love Jesus, why don't you stand to your feet, get out of your chair, push down the front, get in the aisles, just, just come, just make an action step of faith you know, there's not more anointing in the altar. There's not more anointing in the rose. It's a faith step to say that blessed are those who hunger and thirst, for they shall be filled. So if you're hungry, if you're thirsty, if you want His Holy Spirit, if you want His presence in your life, if you want His power in your life, from the front to the back, whether you're in the aisles, the front row, or in your seat, come on, just put your hands up towards heaven. The Bible says if you ask for the Holy Spirit, wouldn't even a good father give his child bread if he asked? He wouldn't give him a stone. He says, therefore, ask for the Holy Spirit. And for those who ask, he will give you the great gift. So open your mouths and either ask for him to fill you for the first time or ask for him to fill you again or ask him to remind you what it felt like yesterday when he gave you the double portion. Just begin to call out, lift your voice. For he fills the hungry, not the needy. Just begin to worship. Just begin to worship.